Hi everyone, it's Friday, December 9th, 2016, and it's 1.30 Eastern Time, and this is Higher Ed Live Special Edition. I'm your host, Aaron Spinka, and on today's live broadcast, we'll pick the brain of former journalist Conway Fraser and get his perspective on pitching your experts to the media. He'll share insights into the scramble for sources, war stories, and secrets to help you break into the news cycle. Higher Ed Live Special Edition is part of the Higher Ed Live Network. Our episodes offer you direct access to the best and brightest minds in education. Be a part of our live broadcast by sharing your knowledge and participate in today's discussion by tweeting us using Higher Ed Live. Today's live viewing experience is powered by Maestro, the premier marketing tech platform for broadcasters. All episodes of Higher Ed Special Edition are free and accessible in the video archives at higheredlive.com and in podcast format on iTunes. Today's episode is made possible by Expert File. Get control of your expert content. Work collaboratively to quickly publish engaging profiles that detail each expert's true talents in just a few clicks, bring profiles to life with video, slides, and publications directly from sources like YouTube, SlideShare, and Amazon. On books. Learn more at exp expertfile.com. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a marketing and communications firm that works with education institutions on branding, digital content design, and more. M. Stoner recently launched a oh, lost my spot. Recently launched new research in partnership with Higher Ed Live and Chegg. Myth busting websites reveals where perspectives from teens using college websites. Oh, my screen just disappeared. Here we go. Oh, I love tech, isn't it great? <laughs> uh, college websites and higher ed marketing professionals converge and differ, and how marketing marketers can leverage this knowledge. I know that right now we're in early decision uh, decision time, and so I'm always interested in this. This research puts to rest seven common myths about what prospective students like and don't like about college websites. The results might surprise you. We'll tweet a link out in a minute to the white paper. I'm excited to be joined by Conway Fraser. He's a former journalist who helps companies and institutions get media coverage. He has more than 25 years of experience as a professional communicator. He's a gifted storyteller with a great capacity for creativity and strategy. Thank you so much for taking time out of your Friday afternoon to join me. You just mentioned he just got out of a five hour session. So if his voice goes, <laughs> why am I blaming him? <laughs> yeah, th thanks for having me. And I should clarify, it was a five-hour media coaching workshop, <laughs> not therapy. That's coming <laughs> later in the day. The therapy is coming after this. Yes, um, and hopefully a lot of tea, honey, and lemon as well will be involved. That's good idea. Keep, <laughs> keep the blood sugar up. I hope everybody watching, it's Friday afternoon, so... Uh, I, I hope they're not uh, in the pub already and starting because <laughs> this this whole webinar will be much much different if people are enjoying <laughs> Friday afternoon as they should be. If and if they are, I would have appreciated a heads up because we could have done the <laughs> webinar from a pub and made it super interesting. This is water. I just not vodka. This is water. Um, and before we dive into my questions, I do want to remind the audience tuning in that they are, you can ask us questions or if you have any things that you'd like to ask specifically, please feel free to tweet us at Higher Ed Live and we'll do our best to get to your questions as they come in. But first, I'm going to start with a couple of my own. And so I spent a little bit of time reading about you, Conway, and I just, I'm curious to hear from you, your your career journey across from journalism. I went to school as a journalist. That's my background. I've moved into higher ed and I'm, I'm just interested how you, how you ended up where you are today. Well, and I will say if you've went online and read about me, half of it's true. The good, <laughs> the good half is true. And the other half, that's just pure, you know, junk that people posted about me. Um, no, I, uh, I was the accidental journalist. Um, I grew up in a northern community in Canada. My dad was a nickel miner, worked uh, 8,000 feet beneath the surface of the earth mining nickel. And uh, when I was in high school, I saw how hard he worked and I saw what a difficult job that was. And, you know, the, the blue collar, hardworking guy. And I immediately thought, wow, I do not want to do that for a living. I, I want to do something fun and uh, something that does not involve risking my life and, uh, and uh, breaking a sweat. So I realized I only really had one gift. I couldn't uh, build anything with my hands or anything like that. I had a big mouth and I asked a lot of questions. And so apparently there's a whole profession for that. Uh, it's politics. But I decided to get into journalism instead. And uh, I went off and uh, I took journalism in, in college and then took political science. And, uh, and it was everything that it was cracked up to be. I had um, an 18 year career at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the CBC, in the United States. That would be your NPR. 
And uh, I was very, very fortunate. I worked with some fantastic people. I traveled uh, around the country and around the world and, uh, and had an incredible experience. And then after about 18 years, I started uh, realizing that uh, there were other things I wanted to, uh, to do in life. So about uh, almost eight years ago, I left the CBC uh, on my own volition, uh, unlike you know, some of the challenges a lot of people are facing in the media today getting laid off. And uh, perhaps some of the people watching today are former journalists, uh, you know, who perhaps lost their jobs and were able to uh, catch on a second career. And welcome to you. We're all part of the same fraternity. And uh, and so I, uh, you know, I decided to, to do something else. And uh, it's been almost seven and a half years. I've done a lot of work with post-secondary institutions, helping them tell their stories uh, to the media. And so my former journalist friends always accused me of going to the dark side. And uh, I said, well... I don't know. It's, it's not all house of cards. It's actually just a lot of fun helping organizations tell their good stories. So that's what I've been doing now for about eight years. And uh, I think the transition has been pretty good because many of my former journalist friends still speak to me. And <laughs> so that, that's a big that's a big badge of honor when they will actually still speak to you when you're on the dark side, so to speak. So that's sort of where I, where I am today. And uh, one of your, uh, well, sorry, your, your main sponsor today, Expert File, mm -hmm. is uh, one of the companies that uh, I'm an advisor for, uh, an unpaid advisor. I'm not here being paid to do this, but uh, uh, a great company that I think is uh, a lot of your people watching today perhaps uh, are doing work with as they, uh, uh, they do a lot of work with American universities helping their experts uh, get into the media. So I'm kind of blessed. I have a great job, love what I do, and uh, happy to be here with you today. I'm, I'm super excited. Um, in my role at my college, I'm actually positioned in the media relations office. And so it's, it's always an interesting, and I work specifically with our channel, our social channels. Um, and so while I'm doing social for the college as a whole and campus life and our news stories, another piece that I haven't quite cracked for us yet is being in the social media field for journalists that are going through their feeds and kind of finding the right places to have content. So when they're looking for a story and maybe when some people go to Twitter or Facebook or wherever to see where conversations are happening, um, that's a that's a definite part of my job that I'd really like to spend more time with. And and I know that even as I was like working studying journalism and working for some local organizations, I would go to Twitter to check what was happening and what was going on. So I know that people do go there for these types of sources, um, but I'm, I'm interested in that. And real quick, it looks like your video cut out for me. So we're getting your audio fine. But if you oh, okay. just take a quick, I'm not sure if it's why you disappeared. <laughs> Okay, let me walk around and take a look. Hold on. All right. Is it back? Oh, we are back. Okay, I think I know what happened. Get, please uh, uh, forgive me for a moment. I think what's <laughs> happened is it, it probably went to sleep on me. Oh, gotcha. That's probably it. So well, let, let's keep going. And if it goes to sleep again, I'll, I'll walk back around. <laughs> Sounds good. You um, know, I'm, like a, I'm like a dinosaur, so I'm not used to this technology. <laughs> um, so... You mentioned a little bit about working mostly with post-secondary schools. What kind of drove you in that direction? Was it when you were a journalist, you just sat there and said, oh, my God, you guys are so awful at this? Or <laughs> did you see the need? What kind of drew you to the higher ed side you of know, it? It was kind of a little bit of both of what <laughs> you just said. When I when I was uh, working for the, uh, the CBC, and uh, I, I, it was kind of why I got into business. I was watching all of these organizations that had great stories to tell. And they were just doing horrible jobs at telling those stories. And I just kept thinking, wow, could I ever help them? Could I ever help them? And, and uh, it's not like the old days. And, and I think many of, your, uh, many of our viewers here today may be uh, younger than I am. I'm 46 years old. And I'm fortunate enough that I started journalism back in the days when uh, sort of pre all of the technology. And then I lived through the evolution of the technology. So I know both worlds. So you talk about going on Twitter and, you know, a lot of journalists go on to social media, look for story ideas. Back when I started my career, you went into a coffee shop near like where the legal offices were and tried to <laughs> overhear the, tried to overhear, listen, listen in on the lawyers talking about the cases they're working on or near the government offices. And you'd, try to eavesdrop in on what they were saying. And so it's kind of uh, evolved. But what's happened is now with, you know, the evolution of social media and the information world that we're in, there's so much white noise out there. It's really difficult for organizations like universities 
to get noticed, to, to cut through all of this, you know, this tsunami of information that's everywhere around us and, and get noticed. And so when I uh, was with the CBC and I decided to leave, I, I thought that, you know, I, I could really help these organizations because I'm a traditional storyteller. I come from that, that background of identifying what makes a good news story and what a reporter wants and then helping them tell that story. And so, in fact, my very first client when I left the CBC was uh, the university in my hometown of Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. And the university uh, there had a new president uh, who was the youngest president in North America at the time. He was 33 years old when he became the president. He's still the president today, about uh, almost eight years later. And he identified the importance of getting their story heard nationally and internationally. So I was retained uh, in particular to help them tell their story beyond the boundaries of the community they were in to get noticed nationally and internationally. So I was hired as a traditional storyteller. It was my very first client. So the, the post-secondary world is very near and dear to my heart because I think colleges and universities are just, you know, buffets of great stories to be told. The problem is a lot of the people in those universities and colleges, the faculty members who are dedicated to teaching students, don't think about whether or not this would make a good news story. And I think these places have an incredible amount of fantastic stories to tell. And so uh, it, it's kind of fun to, to help them tell those stories because, you know, they're not companies. They're not big, you know, big oil companies or big mm -hmm. auto man manufacturers. They're universities. They're places of higher learning and academic freedom. So there's a there's a purity involved with helping post-secondary institutions tell their stories. That's kind of refreshing and helps me uh, as a good Catholic deal with the, uh, the dark side aspect. <laughs> uh, you know, you get to do the good work with the colleges and universities and tell those great stories. So it's a lot of fun. And I'm sure a lot of the people who are watching right now uh, get to see that on a daily basis. Yeah, I mean, that was a large draw for me in higher ed specifically was that, yes, we're telling really cool stories and some of it comes off as marketing language, but it really is to connect people to find the right place to go and the right place to, to work. And, and higher ed, I think, really does have that allure of you get to work and work in a really complex and interesting area, but not necessarily be only selling or only only trying to raise money or only doing one thing or the other. It's really a, a mini economic system of crazy, awesome stories and things that are happening on campus. Well, and telling your story, and you, you just alluded to it, telling your story mm -hmm. helps a university and a college in, in every way, shape and form, as you said. I mean, so why do you want to tell your stories? Why should you care? Well, you know, you, you should care because it not only helps you with enrollment, it helps you with recruitment of professors, the best, the best talent, and it also helps you with fundraising. I mean, fundraising has become such an important part of, uh, of universities. It always has been, but increasingly with challenged, uh, you know, government budgets and, uh, you know, it, there's a lot of people out there raising money. So the one that tells their story the best is the one that, that gets the check, so to speak. And everybody likes to be a part of a winning team. And so if a university can create a bandwagon by telling these positive stories of momentum and change and success, everybody loves to be a part of a winning team. And so then the checkbooks open up. And so there's all sorts of opportunities there to do that. But, you know, the other thing that people don't talk about is, the importance of having your stories seen or read or listened to and what that does to internal morale. So with your existing employees and faculty, everybody loves to, you know, be out mowing the lawn on a, or maybe shoveling your snow this time of year. <laughs> we have uh, snow. <laughs> depending, depending on where you are. Uh, I was in Florida a couple of weeks ago, no <laughs> snow to be seen. But um, depending on what you're doing, it's nice to have your neighbor kind of go, hey, Conway, yeah, I read that story in the paper about the great stuff you guys do. That feels good. And, and so there's also the internal morale and the, you know, the enjoyment and satisfaction and pride of working somewhere. So I just think storytelling is the... Uh, the magic elixir that uh, that uh, does so much good for organizations. So uh, it, working with universities, though, I, I will tell you the biggest challenge, and I think you and I could both share war stories on this one, is finding those stories. Universities are these huge ecosystems. And to get to find out what the stories are in there, because sometimes there are really good stories happening in a faculty and you don't even know they're out there because professors, uh, faculty don't typically think like that. 
you know, they just think about teaching and doing the research and not many of them think about, wow, this is a story I should send to the marketing and communications department. This, this could be a really good story for uh, the university. And I think that's one of the big challenges that universities have is, you know, even digging out those stories within their own organization. Do I have a war story for you then? Um, <laughs> okay. One of our best stories from this year um, was found because the media relations officer who actually ended up taking lead on pitching it and we did an April Fool's video around it, the everything was found because he went running in the arena, our football stadium and was doing the steps and saw them working. We um, At Dartmouth, we developed the mobile virtual player, uh, which is the, the robotic football tackling dummy that's really kind of taken the American football system by storm. Mm -hmm. And we were connected to it because he was out on a workout and he saw them working with it on the field. And he had been in touch about the prototype and the working on it and things that were coming up about it, but he hadn't heard that it was functioning yet. And so all of this happened in like this and suddenly we just had all of this media hit all of this coverage and it, it came from him just going to run the steps at his football stadium, the football stadium that day. And they were out working with it. And it was just, had he, what happens if he had decided to just stay on the treadmill? All right. Well, right. And that's the thing is a lot of the great stories that happen, happen like that. They happen by serendipity or chance or luck. And so what I try to talk to my clients about is, how do you take chance and luck out of that equation? How do you, how do you make this more of a system? How do you make this more of a, a structure? And there are all sorts of ways to do that. I mean, like you know, with the, with the people out there watching right now who are on the expert file platform, that's one way because it's an expert database, but I think the marketing and communications people, you know, really have to get out there and start talking one-on-one -on -one with the departments, one of the things that we've done is gone out and, and meet with the departments, one one department at a time, and not just the department heads, but all the profs, and just do a little, you know, work at lunch lecture, and not even a lecture, a conversation, but what makes a good news story, and what's in it for you? So the professors are obviously often like, well, pff, this doesn't do anything for me. Why do I care? I get my research grant. I teach mm -hmm. my students. We do good work. And you have to talk to them about what's in it for them. And these days, what's in it for them is, you know, Content marketing, even if you're a professor, you're a faculty member, getting noticed in the media can help you even if you're going for a research grant. Don't kid yourself. The organizations that are handing out research grants obviously care about the research and the information, but they also want to know how is this research grant going to make us look good? Is there a good story in here for us? And so if you have a professor who's kind of media savvy and media friendly working for an institution that's media savvy and media friendly, um, that certainly helps open up, you know, research grants and organizations that want to get involved with you. I come back to my main theme, which is everybody likes a winner. And so there is something in it for the faculty members. And that's what we say to them is like, you look at it, if I, if I can, you know, speak to the lowest common denominator, which is self-interest. And it is the lowest common denominator, but it is one that people seem to relate to. There is something in it for the professors. And I think that's something that you have to communicate because they're the ones that have all the stories. They're the ones that know what's going on. I mean, you know, as you know, up in Canada, hockey is a big thing. And if you want to know what's going on in a hockey team, don't ask the coach, ask the guy who sharpens the skates because he knows everything. Right. And the people down in the trenches know. And so it's very frustrating for the marketing communications people with universities that I've worked with uh, to try and get out there and, and open up those lines of dialogue with the faculty members to get those good stories pouring in. And again, I come back to, you know, these places are fantastic places of, uh, of great stories. So, uh, yeah, it's a it's a challenge, but it's it's a hell of an opportunity as well. Yeah. And it looks like your camera fell asleep again. But if you want to check that while I'm just I'm you do Yep, something you said really sparked uh, something that I'm seeing more and more is that grant writing is huge and getting grants, obviously very important. And the piece that I'm seeing more and more come across my desk is the publicity and the social media. How will you make what you're working on more transparent to the media? How will you share what you're working with the greater public? And so we get a lot of professors um, and some of our media relations officers who are coming into my office to see if we can work up some kind of plan um, so that at least we're featuring our work on our main channels or we're, we're getting out some of this research because it is becoming an, a very uh, larger part of 
grants and I'm seeing it more and more as time goes on, they want to know, okay, well, how are you going to promote what you're doing to a larger group of people than just your inner circle or the inner circle of scientists or researchers that are naturally interested or paying attention to this type of subject? And it's also speaking a language that those outside audiences understand too, because one of the challenges when you're communicating, uh, you know, with, with fa- faculty members and universities outward is appreciating. Am I back, by the way? Yes, you're good. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I found out what it was. I was going to sleep every 10 minutes, which is just <laughs> sort of the story of my life. But, uh, Me too. The, uh, That's odd. <laughs> the, the, the language that we speak is important. And so what I mean by that is, you know, universities and colleges and places of higher education and professors in particular Many of them, depending on the department, they speak their own language. It might as well be Klingon. It's so technical. It's so intrinsic to uh, higher education that there's almost a translation that has to happen to get those stories out through the media. <clears throat> and it's one of the biggest things is you know to speak, speak the English that regular people speak, that journalists think, uh, that, that the journalists speak. And so uh, often I find with some post-secondary institutions – uh, one of the challenges they have is that they send things out to the media and whether it's for, uh, you know, to increase the exposure on fundraising or research or recruitment and they, they, they're confused because they don't get any uptake from, from the media. And I've been brought in by, by universities and they've said, okay, look at, here's like 15 news releases we've sent out over the past you know, eight months and we're not getting any uptake. Can you tell us what's wrong? And, and two things I say is I look at it and I read it and I go, I don't understand half the language in here. This is university speak or this is faculty speak or department specific speak. If it's medicine or engineering or something like that, you need to explain to people why they should care in language they understand, first of all. And the second thing is, you know, news releases. So outbound news releases do play a role, in my opinion, and again, this is just my opinion, they do play a role if you're having a big funding announcement or a big research announcement or a big event. But if you're trying to sell a specific human interest story or a story about something that's happened that's really, really interesting in your in your university, I'm more of a fan of reaching out one-on-one to specific reporters and offering them a story versus a blast out. Because as a former journalist and speaking as somebody who was a journalist, when I received a news release into my newsroom and I saw it and I saw that it was sent to all the media, unless it's a groundbreaking story, some huge announcement, I, I'll look at it and I go, well, I'm not going to cover this. They sent this news release to all the media and media is very competitive and I want my own story. So sometimes I say, depending on the story, you may be better off contacting an individual reporter and saying, hey, I wanted to float the story idea with you. If you don't want it, that's fine. I'll shop it around with somebody else. But I wanted to give you a first crack at it. And I get a really high success rate doing that. Um, it, so you may not get five, sto- five small stories. You may get one mm-hmm. big story. But that one big story you know, has so much value. And then and you have to kind of go around the circle, make sure the next time you have an original story, offer it to a different journalist. You don't want to p- play favorites with reporters. You want to sp- spread the love around a little bit, make yeah. sure everybody, everybody gets some. But um, it's also the way that we communicate. And so when you're talking about developing expertise within your universities, the other way to do that, even better than a news release, and even better than you calling a reporter is empowering your faculty to start, you know, said building, you know, expert profiles, um, blogging, creating content marketing, um, that sort of thing. I, I wasn't always a blogger, uh, I, even though I was in the media and a professional writer and a journalist. It was only about a year and a half ago that uh, uh, Peter Evans, the CEO of Expert Files, said to me, "You should really be blogging and showing off, you know, kind of your expertise." And I thought. There's no money in that. Why would I do that? That makes no sense. And he started talking to me about content marketing. I'm not a marketing expert. I'm a media mm-hmm. expert. And so he told me about that. So I started writing a blog and uh, conwayfraser.com, if anybody wants to take a look at it. No ads, I promise. But what happened was the more I started blogging, I actually started, get, started getting called by the media more and more and more to do media interviews about the subject matter I was writing about. And so now I'm getting a lot of media, whereas in my first almost six years in business, I almost got no media. I wasn't really seeking it. The minute I started a blog and started my content marketing, the media started coming to me. 
And I think that's a, another avenue that universities and faculties should start thinking about. Is that sort of that outbound content marketing. And I know a lot of you are doing it, but it's another way to, to supplement it. But it's all rooted in telling a story that journalists want to know. And I mean, if anybody out there, if you're a journalist who recently left the media, you know how difficult it is for the journalists today. The journalists have a difficult, um, you know, there are fewer journalists today. I don't have to tell you in the United States, the amount of job cuts in the media, yet they still have to provide the content. And so they're having to do so much work with so little time and so few resources that I think it's, you know, incumbent on places like universities to outbound that information to journalists because they want the stories and they need the stories. And, and today the media is such a speed game. It's all about getting the story fast and efficient. And I think universities are great places, uh, you know, great sort of foundations to get that information out and, uh, and help journalists because the journalists I know they do want those story ideas, but it's not like the old days where I mentioned I used to go into a coffee shop for two hours and just listen in on conversations, don't judge me, and figure out how I got the story. Now, you know, the journalists have to, they, the stories have to come to them and not just in news release form. So I uh, kind of meandered a bit there. I don't know if there was any value in that, but I sort of no, went off, that went off you, on a bit of a riff. You kind of read my mind because my next question is the the ongoing, I think, struggle we have, not struggle, but the, the back and forth that we have here is how, like, the value of putting it on our own news site and breaking the story from our news site or covering this great thing from our news perspective and then getting that story, even though it's already been done in one way out to the media um, to have them do a spin on it. So we've had stories that pick up our videos that we've done and it hasn't, they don't always necessarily write a whole new feature, but they put our, like they embed our video. We did, we just did a, a video on a, professor who studied who was in Greenland for six weeks collecting ice cores to study the melt and so we put together this really visual uh piece about it um and it got picked up by some local media that wanted to feature it in a larger discussion about climate change uh and so that that's something that I'm always kind of trying to figure out in my head okay well do we write this great story on our piece and is that helpful to journalists in their end where they see wow school XYZ has, has this great person who works there. They put this video together. Um, we can just link to the video or maybe we can even do our own standalone piece. And that's kind of the question, not really a question, but an observation or a, something that I always go back and forth about. What, where is that line of let's, we want someone to cover it or do we, do we hinder ourselves by covering it our, our, on our own channels and then asking others to cover it or kind of what's that, what's the mm. right mix there? Well, are you, I guess the question is, are you looking for local media or national media or state media? What, what's your kind of primary uh, target audience that you're going for? Just using that as an example, let's talk through this. Um, so I think this one, definitely local, because lo local naturally, because we the, the community around us is very climate uh, oriented. They, they pay attention. Uh, Vermont and New Hampshire are very interested in how things are working um, with the climate change and things like that. Uh, but also that's something that I think we would like to see on a national scale because we are a school that is interested in, we have a professor who has a whole Arctic studies program and is, we're really, we do have a lot of focus and research de devoted to this, the, the environment. So I think, I think it definitely has a national piece that could go with it. Um, so when you're, when you're dealing with these, uh, you know, I'm sure you have beat reporters and things in the mm -hmm. circle. What is, what's your success rate been when you post your own content? Are you getting any, uh, are you getting uptake? Have you seen any success with that? I definitely think we have. We've, we've done a couple of really long feature pieces that, um, have required a lot of resources from us, but it has been nice to see it like even a, a smaller scale thing. So if we do a feature on a student, um, clubs that they're organize, they work with and the larger national version of the clubs pick it up. So maybe not media in the same sense as that, but we, we've seen return on that kind of investment where people who are interested or the areas, um, for instance, we have a large veterans population um, and we do a lot of great uh, work with our veterans um, through a program that we just joined Posse Foundation and it, it always gets a nice pickup and, and, but what you see more is the, the very niche outlets that pick it up. They're national, but it's 
like a veteran specific news right. organization or it's a it's a foundation that shares the news about this a separate foundation that shares the news about our work with this other foundation mm -hmm. yeah i i think you know i mean content marketing can be successful the problem is it depends on how fast you want to get the story out because mm -hmm. owning your own content like that is a fantastic way of reaching journalists journalists now you have to you know obviously you have to find the channels that they're in so of course tweeting that stuff mm -hmm. out because journalists are really on twitter that's one place where i can guarantee 98 percent of the journalists i know are on twitter uh even though everybody's not on twitter more people are on facebook uh twitter is a great place to tweet that content out but it's more of a long game and and so that's why embedding that stuff into you know their expert profiles and building a body of work is fantastic but if you need something out quickly and you have a great story and it's kind mm -hmm. of time sensitive I'm much more a fan as a former journalist I appreciated it much more as a reporter when the head of marketing communications for University XYZ would call me and say we have a story it's not quite worthy of a news release um, but it's a really good kind of human interest story or a mm -hmm. really good story and I just wanted to see if you were interested in it. And if you're not, hey, no big deal. I really, you know, I liked that soft sell of you mm -hmm. must do this story. This story is the best story ever. Yeah. You have to cover this. And I'd be like, so I liked it when they said, look, we just wanted to, you know, offer you this story, um, you know, if, if you're interested uh, in it. And if not, no big deal. We'll just give you first crack at it. And sometimes I'd be like, yeah, you know what? I'll do that story. Um, and it was just the idea that every reporter likes an exclusive. And even if it's not big, you know, breaking news on CNN, they, they do like just a nice exclusive mm -hmm. human interest story, something that's going to get some clicks because it's all about the clicks today on social media, yeah. even with journalists, more so with journalists. Um, you know, they, their editors want, it, want stories that click. And sometimes those good, you know, stories about one person doing something amazing get more social media traffic than, you know, the big hard hitting stories. I think a lot of people are getting turned off by a lot of the negativity in the news these days. And they like to read stories about people doing interesting stuff and cool stuff. And that's the kind of, those are the kinds of things that come out of university. So don't, uh, you know, I'd be curious to know from your perspective in your department, you know, uh, what success you've had, if any, with sort of uh, trying that technique and 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 if it's not really a technique that's been tried mm -hmm. I, enc I encourage you to, to to give it a shot to work those one-on-one -on -one relationships um for those those stories that aren't quite worthy of a news release and um you know content marketing may be good but you kind of need that story to get out in the next week and so content marketing might take a a little more time challenge is what I found and I would here's a war story for you from, but <laughs> I worked for a university once and um, what I saw increasingly were the professors that some of them were engaged were contacting the marketing and communications departments and saying we've done this amazing thing and we want you to put out a news release on it and we've taken the liberty of writing the news release for you and so we've it's in your inbox and you open this thing and for Christ's sakes, it looks like war and peace. It's like seven pages of just gobbledygook. And I'm like, what am I going to do? And, and, and so it got to the point where you couldn't put them out. I said to the marketing communications department, if you send this out, you're going to lose all your credibility with the media. And they said, well, if we don't put it out, then the faculty is going to be upset with us. And they're going to say, we're playing favorites. And I, and I said, well, put it out. But like, put it on your news site, on your website, but don't actually distribute it to the media. So you can send them a link and say, okay, it's out there. Here's the link. You can go look at it. So it was kind of like the happy medium because, <laughs> you know, if you start sending out these ridiculous, you know, news releases of stories that are not worthy of a, of a news release, then you lose credibility with the media as a marketing communications department. You can't be the, the boy or girl who cried wolf by sending out stuff all the time. I think you should save your news releases for big news so that when it comes across the media's desk, it means something as opposed mm -hmm. to, so there are other avenues, there are other mediums for delivering that information. You talked about your own content marketing, but try the, um, uh, try those one-on-one -on -one calls with journalists and, you know, and ask them if they're interested with a really soft sell. And um, I, I'd be curious to see if you get any uh, any success with that. Yeah, I, I know that we do some of that. And I, I can say that 
some of our stories do come from those relationships of where we just have like a quick update of coffee over coffee or something. What's happening on campus? Do you have any super interesting things that are happening? Anything that you haven't gotten to cover? And we see a lot of success from that. So that's something that I think is definitely like, it's just super valuable, especially with, again, where we're just in every field, it feels like that there's just an oversaturation with things. And so that like the standing out, and if that means a phone call, which <laughs> seems to be slowly going away or yeah. a coffee or something to make the difference or the, the, Hey, I'm just going to take a little bit of your time. I don't want to overwhelm you. Um, well, it's super valuable. You mentioned, you mentioned the coffee and you know, so one thing for people out there, and again, I apologize if people already know some of this, but it's sort of come to my head is, you know, the best, the reason why they call it media relations is because it's about relationships with the media. And the best time to build a relationship with a journalist is when you don't want anything from them. And I always encourage marketing and communications and media specific people with any organization, whether you're a company or a, or a university, is meet those reporters when you don't want something from them and develop a relationship with them and get to know them. And they're going to be surprised. You're going to invite them for a coffee and they're going to, okay, what do you want? Just wanted to get to know you and give you my number and tell you we're here. And you know, you, you might work that relationship for six months before it bears any fruit, but then you develop that relationship with the reporter where yes, they're going to call you on every Monday and say, Hey, do you got anything going this week? It's a slow news week. And you know, my friends know who have ever gone to lunch with me. I get several calls a day from reporters all over mm -hmm. the country, North America, who are sort of saying, it's a slow news day. Do you have anything that uh, might be newsworthy? I need to put something on the air or in the paper tomorrow. Do you have anything? And quite often I'll have four or five things sort of in my tickle trunk of, uh, of uh, that's a Canadian reference, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, it's Mr. Dress Up. Google it. It's called Mr. Dress Up. Anyways. <laughs> I just realized how bad that sounded. Anyways. <laughs> my satchel of story ideas and uh and and they and they thank me not only do they do the story which helps one of my clients mm -hmm. they thank me they're like wow you saved my ass today thank you so much for that and so um you know that idea that if you develop those relationships and i'm sure many of you have and i'm sure you have as well but uh you know continuously developing those relationships because the media turnover is so high the minute you develop a relationship with a reporter you know they've moved on to you know maybe a larger affiliate or the network or maybe they left the business altogether and all of a sudden you have a brand new reporter and you have to develop the relationship all over again but those relationships do bear fruit if you invest in them but you really do have to invest in them because reporters and i was a reporter i remember people only called me when they wanted something and that really uh, you know i played the game but that wasn't a real relationship whereas i had a handful of people who would you know develop relationships with me call me sometimes and give me a story idea that had nothing to do with their institution mm -hmm. or their organization yeah and I, I thank you for that thanks yeah i owe you one and it's all about building relationship and uh, and currency i i think the secret to media relations is all in the relations side of it. Um, that's the big part that I think a lot of people gloss over very quickly. Twitter is great. Facebook is great. Texting is great and all that kind of stuff, but nothing. And I may be dating myself here, but nothing beats sitting down and having a coffee with someone. It's still the best method of outreach. I employ that in my day to day with meeting people across campus because we can so easily fall into the person behind the email person behind the phone, but never actually see what the other person looks like um right. your your relations building made me think of all the emails that i get that start out with a hi how are you doing and i only hear from them once in a blue moon and suddenly you look down two lines and it's like by the way i was wondering if you could, it's like you know you could just jump into that i don't need the I don't need right. the extra because I know what this email is about because I never ever hear you, from you except for these very specific items. Um, right. We're getting towards the end of our time. The hour okay. flew by, but I was just wondering for you talk. You really talk a lot. I, I'm so talkative. I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry, I yap a lot. I um, you have already given us some great uh, things of that were the mistakes that we're making in higher ed. Is there anything else that like, and a lot of the things you've said are quite doable on our own. So it's, it's not that we don't have to spend a ton of resources. We don't have to hire a new or employ a new tool or anything. Or is there anything else that we're doing wrong that are quick, easy fixes that could change our game for us? Well, I don't, I don't think it's about doing anything wrong. And mm -hmm. I always tell people, you know, media relations and marketing, they don't teach this stuff in the science department. 
Um, you know, a lot of this is about sociology and psychology and good storytelling. And I think fundamentally, you know, I think so it, it really is. It's key. One is you have to get and this is the hardest part. You have to get your faculty on board. You have to get them on board with what you're trying to do in telling good stories, because these stories can't come from the, you know, the ivory towers of the universities. They have to come from, as journalists, we want to hear from the profs. We want to hear from the students, the leaders, the faculty members. Respectfully, we don't want to hear from the vice president of academic. I mean, they have a place, but that's not who I want to hear from as a journalist. Mm -hmm. I want to hear from the guy down in the muck who's doing the work. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's a mining reference, by the way. So I'll just keep dropping these all day long. But uh, everybody's Googling right now. What the hell does he mean by muck? Um, so um, it's important to get your faculty members on board, first of all. But secondly, and even more importantly, is pick out your stars. Pick out who your stars are in faculty. And it's horrible to say that, but you know, everybody has a favorite kid. Sorry, kids. <laughs> I've got four kids. Sorry if you're watching. There is one favorite. You guess, you guess which one it is. It, it's not you. It's you. Um, My family totally knows who the favorite is. I'm one of four and we've always known. It's like, Tori, you're the favorite. We know. <laughs> of course. That's, that's, uh, you know, and you hate her, right? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I know. Uh, so, but it's picking out who your best faculty members are and really pushing them out more than others. And I hate to say that, but making sure as well that they are ready to speak to the media. So there are very smart people out there doing very good things, but they're not media coached and they're not media trained. And, you know, that's the kind of thing I do, you know, on a daily basis is getting people ready to speak to the media. And so you can have the best ideas ever, the best product, but if you can't communicate it properly, so it's about getting them ready. So first, getting them identified as experts and you know, using something like expert file to make sure they're profiled. Getting media coached so they're ready for the media. If you do those two things, your job as a media relations person and marketing communications person is going to be made exponentially easier because now you have something that you can work with. And the other thing, and most importantly, is remember that this is a speed game. The media today is all about speed, getting the story out fast, Reporters don't have a lot of time. They're shortchanged. So you really have to help them. You, you have to almost be a field producer. Say, okay, I have an idea on where you may want to do this interview. And here's a photo you may want. And here I prepared a one page, you know, a fact sheet for you that might help you. You have to do a bit of this stuff to really help the journalists. And if you become that kind of facilitator, they will keep coming back time and time again. I know it sounds like a lot of work, mm -hmm. but, but the payoff is, is, is immense when you do that sort of thing. And the final thought that I would leave you with is I'll come back to the basics and it's all about the story. And it's all about, you know, ask yourself one question that gets asked in newsrooms every day. When stories are being pitched by reporters, a producer like me will sit back and look back at the reporter and say, well, that's a good story, but why should I give a shit? Why should I care? And it's all about answering that question. You have to be able to answer before you go out to the media with a story. Why should the public care? Why should anybody care about the story? And if you can't answer that question, then you need to go back to the drawing board and figure out why. But that is a fundamental aspect to every pitch that you sent out. And you can talk about social media and Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. Those are all just vehicles for delivering information. At the end of the day, the most important thing above all else is what's your story? And why should people care? That is the fundamental aspect of storytelling. It, what, it has been for 500 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years, and it will be for another five or 10,000. The, the vehicles for delivering the information may change. Maybe it's a TV camera today. Maybe it's an iPad that I'm using tomorrow. It'll be a watch the next day. <laughs> but, it, but it's still all about storytelling. And we are storytellers. Everybody here, you're a storyteller. Everybody else is a storyteller. And so uh, never forget that. Never lose sight of all the bells and the whistles and the social media platforms, all very important. But focus on what makes a good story and getting your people ready to tell it. I, that, that's okay. We're done. We're out. That was a great, great note to end on. That was, I just want to thank you so much for joining me. And as always, our program sponsors, Expert File and M Stoner, this conversation was a great cap well i have a couple more hours but a great cap to the end of my friday and i hope it was for all of our viewers at home thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day and weekend <laughs>